Take your Bibles to John chapter 1. I kind of introduced this last week. We had Graduate Sunday, and I wanted to dive into what Jesus was saying in the last part of those verse 42 of what he was going into, and we just didn't have the time, and so it kind of paused on it so we could pick it up today. It's so important for us to get this because God has called us to so much more, so much more. We talked, we, we started this off talking about like people mentally not knowing who they are, putting up the filters, trying to be something, trying to fit in, trying to be accepted of other people. It's a battle that everybody faces. It's, it's, it's in our culture today. It's just, I want to be accepted. I want to be liked. I want to, I want to, I want to be pulled in. It's just, I want to belong. Everybody has that. And then we, we, we can talk about, well, your identity is in Christ, and through Christ you truly live. When we get to this part, we're not just talking about living. That, that's not enough. We're talking about that you might live more abundantly. The, the, what the Bible has about thriving in life and, and, and not just surviving in life. So there, there's a verse and, and, and later in the book of John, and Jesus was teaching, and he said, The thief, our enemy, cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and destroy. Steal your identity. Steal your purpose. Make you feel like you have nothing to live for. Like life is just a mess. He loves to pull from you. He does this mentally in our minds. It's like nobody loves you. Nobody cares about you. But God, God doesn't just give us our identity. The rest of that verse, he said, but I've come that you might have life. And that you might have it more abundantly, the fulfilled life. It's the opposite of what Satan is bringing us. So through our, our, our creator, we, we discovered last week that God created us and he gives us our identity. He, he tells us who are you. He, he tells us what we're here for. He tells us what, what, what we do, what, that we belong, that we have purpose. He wants us to thrive in that life and live it more abundantly. I, I want to review just a little bit, kind of fill in the blanks of where we were last week, and then we'll jump into the new part. We're talking about how... Simon was introduced to Jesus. Well, actually, Jesus introduces Simon to, to Peter. He introduced Peter to Peter. And if you put it that way, and I'll explain what I mean if you missed this last week. So the Bible says in John 1 40, one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And so let me just lay this out. He was like, we found the creator. We found the inventor of our lives. We found the one that knows everything about us, the promised one, the one that has come from God. So here they, they, they come into the presence of Jesus. You can imagine all these guys standing around, maybe them being skeptics or not being fully uh, understanding what's going on in the situation, that this is the Messiah, this is the promised one. So they come into that thing. Jesus walks up and he says, when he beheld Simon, he walks up and he said, you are Peter. Now, for us, we don't think anything about that. You sit there and say, yeah, Peter's Peter. Well, Peter wasn't called Peter then. Peter was called Simon then. So Jesus just comes right out and says, I know who you are. I, I, know, what, I know everything about you. He said, you're going to be called, uh, the, which is being interpreted, the stone. He said in verse 42, and Jesus said unto him, and he beheld him, and he said, thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas, which is in, by interpretation a stone. This is what we learned last week, and we'll just go through this for a second. Our creator gives us our real identity. It's our, our, our creator. <clears throat> Let me, if you weren't here for this, I, I gave the illustration of my son making these stilts. At, at first, I came out and asked you guys, what are these? Nobody knew what they were. We guessed bird feeder. We guessed, you know, <clears throat> plant stain, all these other things. It's like none of those things. And you say, what are they? Oh, I can tell you. If everybody can form their opinions and the feelings, but I just go back to the one that created and say, son, what is this? Oh, dad, I'm glad you asked. These are stilts. Okay, son, what do they do? Oh, they make you stand higher and be able to access things. And this is how they work. And this is how they were designed. And this is what their purpose is. How did you get that information? I asked the creator. He is the designer. He knows what he's doing. He knows you. So then what we went through, he knows you. He went right up to Peter. He knows you. He created you. The Bible says in Jeremiah 1, 5, 5, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Man, God knows the inside and out. God knows your insecurities. God knew Peter better than Peter knew Peter. God knows you better than you know you. He knows your weaknesses. He knows your strength. He knows your potential. He gets you. There's so many people that are just like, man, I'm just so, I'm different. 
And I don't know why I can't be like so-and-so that gets on the stage. I can't be like my brother. I can't be like my sister. I, I'm, I'm, I'm different. I don't, I don't know where I fit in. I don't know where I belong. Peter was probably that odd guy. And Jesus comes right up to him and says, man, I get you, Peter. He's explaining him. He's explaining why he is the one that sticks his foot in his mouth, why he gets in trouble all the time. He, was, he, he gets you. He designed you. You're not an accident. He said, I will, I, we read this verse, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. By marvelous are thy works. When you, when you start with the creator, you understand. He gets me. He knows me. Let, me. let me take it further. He designed you. Every aspect of you, he, he, he's going to take you. And if I had a toolbox right now and I pulled out one tool at a time and just said, what is this? This is a socket wrench. What is this? This is a crescent wrench. What is this? This is, you know, we could go through all the different tools. And, and you compare them to each other. They're all weird and different. But God says, let me show you. If you go into the hand of the, knows, the one that knows what you are, it can put you to work to make you feel fulfilled in life because he knows what you do. He gets you. And a lot of times people are like, I'm not like so-and-so. You weren't created to be like so-and-so. You were created to be different. God designed you on purpose. You're not an accident. He loves you. Two chapters later, God starts declaring his love for them. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You need to start with this because a lot of times when people get to that point of suicide and depression and my life doesn't matter, man, Satan will play tricks on your mind and you're sitting there saying, I don't matter. Or God says, you matter so much that I gave my life for you. That's how much you matter. You matter beyond description. If we can write that verse out and don't leave out the so in that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That love is agape love. I mean, he loves you, and to go back to the first thing, he knows you, that's true, and he loves you. An unconditional love, his love is not altered for you because he knows your faults and your failures and everything about you, but also we find that he desires you. Peter did not seek Jesus, Jesus sought out Peter. He comes to him on the shoreline, walks up to him, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men, follow with me, I want to spend time with you, follow me, I want to train you. Follow me, I want to show you what you were made to be. Follow me, I want you in my life. Peter, I, I, I want to pray with you and I want to talk with you and I want to sit with you and I want to eat with you. He wants you. The, 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 we don't get this in the world around us because we have this thing, well, you're not good enough. You're, you're not like so-and-so. You're not a Christian like so-and-so. You don't add up to this. Man, all these things prove to us that all these things were, this was his identity that God was laying out in his life. Our creator gives us our identity. John 1, and he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus beheld him and said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. This is who you are, Peter. And like I said, he introduces Peter to Peter. It's, it's going back to my illustration of that, let's say, in Jordan, what is that? And Jordan says, oh, these are stilts. How do you know? I made them. What do they do? Let me show you. Because he's the author of that. He's the one that is able to do that. <clears throat> if you don't know what you are, you don't know what you do. Do you guys get that? If we don't start with our identity, if you don't even know what you are, or where you came from, or what it is, you'll never be able to live out your purpose if you don't start with it. Because that, it's like if I was to go in there without saying the identity that these are stilts, and I just start using it as a planner and say, man, this doesn't work. It's worthless. It's stupid doesn't add up. It doesn't work well. The creator says, that's because you're not using it right. So many people are not using their lives right because they don't understand where they came from to begin with. Our creator gives us our identity, but let's pick up where we left off last week. But our identity gives us our purpose. I gave you the staggering stats. Suicide between the ages of like 10 and, and 20 some has increased over the last 20 years by 33%. It's staggering. Why so much identity crisis? Why so many mental uh, problems and, and anguish and anxiety and depression that's going on? It's not just a matter of not knowing who we are. It's a matter of not knowing what we do. It's, not, it's about a matter of not living out our, our purpose in this. So Jesus walks to him and says, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas by interpretation a stone. Now, you've got to understand something. There's a lot of things that we do in the Bible that God changes people's names. God's not changing his name here. 
Now, for instance, when you go back to Abraham, he said, you'll no longer be Abram, but you'll be Abraham. His wife, Sarai, was Sarah. I, I, I could take you to a lot of people in the Bible. There was Jacob. He said, you'll no longer be Jacob. Your name now is Israel. New Testament, you'll no longer be Saul, but now you'll be called Paul. God changed their names. God's not changing their name. Let me prove it. Through on here, it wasn't just a matter of him being called Peter, the rock. He was called Simon Peter. Simon Peter. Go through the rest of the Gospels. Read through there. You'll find Simon Peter. God was adding on a descriptor to, to, to Simon's, what he was doing. God was identifying him, giving him a description of what he was meant to be. He was fulfilling that out and, and explaining it. The word Peter means Cephas, which is a rock or a stone. I'm going to ask you guys a question. How many of you guys know what your name means? Raise your hand if you already know what your name means, okay? Very few of you in here can say that. Can I tell you guys, I don't know, my mom is here with me today. Mom, did you know when you named me what my name meant? That's okay. Uh, I'm just going to tell you, uh, you nailed it. I'll just put it like that. You didn't even know, but you nailed it. It means priceless one, okay? So... <laughs> I looked up Dave's. I'm not even going to say it in church. It doesn't matter. <clears throat> but my name means priceless one. Now, I don't think I would use that in everyday life like Simon Peter did. Can you imagine me just going into, you know, out back and putting in my name? Who's this name for? Just, just put down priceless one. It's fine, you know. <laughs> Look up my name on Facebook. It just says priceless one, you know. We, we, we don't normally use the description of our names and things. He's here. And he's talking about who he was. Can you imagine the other guys standing around? And I said this last week. Jesus comes up and he says, thou art Peter. And they're all sitting there saying, Peter? Doesn't that Peter mean a rock? He's calling him the rock? He's the most unstable guy in our group. He's the one doing stupid things all the time. You guys know everybody has a friend group and you got the weird one, okay? You got the friend group and you got the one always doing stupid things. That was Peter in this situation. Peter was always doing dumb things. And Jesus... The Messiah walks up to him and he says, I know you. you, you are Simon, you are Peter, you are the rock. And Jesus, even in that passage, interprets that, what, it was, what he was talking about in the passage. He said, thou shalt be called Cephas. Peter didn't get this. Can I explain why we don't get this? You are so much more than what you know. You are so much more than what you know. You are, the thing is, you are more than what you can see. If we were, to, this is how we evaluate ourselves of our potential. If we go to the mirror, there's two ways that we do this. We, we evaluate ourselves. We go to the mirror and we'll look at who we are. You know what we see when we look in the mirror of who we are? We saw all of our faults, all of our failures, all of our insecurities, what I do wrong, what I'm not good at. Man, I remember when I was in high school and I had to get up and speak before the student body and I was in a position of doing those kind of things. I messed up every single time, every single time. So then when I had the thought of going into ministry, you know what pulled me out of surrendering to preach over and over again? I am terrible at this. I can't do this. I, I can't speak in front of people. I, I, I can't get my thoughts in order. All these insecurities that was there. So I would look in the mirror. Jesus was not telling Peter just who he was at the time, but who he was created to be. It was his potential. You were then more than what others can see. We'll grow up and have people, and I know this kind of goes back to our first message with this. People come up and label you as a loser. You're a loser. You, you'll never be good at anything. Well, that gets in our mind, and all of a sudden, every time we have a job or a new opportunity of branching out to do something, it's in our mind. I'll never do that. I know. I am a loser. I'm not good at that. I'm a failure. You'll start thinking about other things that you've done that you feel that. I promise you, if you were to go up to Peter and pull him off to the side and say, so you're the rock. I don't, I don't know, man. It's like he said that, but maybe he's not the Messiah after all because obviously he doesn't know me. You are more than what you can see. Let me explain. I'm not talking about the way that the world would talk about this of look in the mirror and say, you got this, man. You're the dude. You're, you're awesome. You know, I'm not talking about that self-edification of that. The world is constantly looking for something. Constantly. Have you ever noticed how the tabloids are filled with them, like so-and-so got married to this supermodel, and they've got a private jet, and uh, they, they own their own island, and they, they, they made billions of dollars, and all this other stuff, the crazy amounts of money and stuff like this, and yet that you still hear about their divorces, drug addiction, you hear about their suicide attempts and everything. Why? Because we're created 
with the, to, to have God in our lives. When you don't have God in your lives, you're constantly looking for something to fill that void because you were meant to have God in your life. So here I was when I was 16 years old, had a Christian life, had a great home, had everything going for me, Christian school, but I was lost. Grew up in church. I know you guys have heard my testimony over and over again. When I was 16 years old, I went down to the altar, not that it has to be at the front of a church, but that's what I did. I prayed with somebody, explained to them that I grew up in church, that I was battling with this. I got it right in my heart. But let me tell you something that you didn't see. The Spirit of God came to live inside of me. Now, that that doesn't make sense to everybody. And I I didn't walk back to my seat and somebody goes like, wow, the, the Holy Spirit looks really good on you, dude. I mean, that never happened. You know, I didn't, I didn't walk around. Nobody could see what God did on the inside of me. Nobody can see what God does on the inside of you. Now, obviously, when the Spirit of God begins to work in your life, what's on the inside begins to show on the outside. Let me, let me tie a verse into this, okay? I want you guys to start connecting the dots of what God was promising, what God was doing in Peter's life. 1 John 4, 4, you are of God little children and have overcome them. Now listen to this. Because greater is he that is in you than he's that in the world. He that is in you. Every person that is here, that you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I need to tell you something. There is more to you than what you can see. It's more to you. The Spirit of God comes and lives inside of us. God wasn't just talking about where Peter was at. God was talking about what God was going to do in Peter's life, the potential to change the world, the potential to leave your family. You sit there and say, I am a failure. Maybe you are a failure. Maybe you're not good at things, but let me tell you what Philippians says. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Something has changed in my life. Now, you might not fully understand it, but I'll tell you, the more you listen and follow the Savior, the more you're going to understand that there is more to you than meets the eye. God does something inside of your life. Peter was created to be the rock, to be strong, to be the leader, all these things. And a lot of times, listen to this, we miss out on the potential of what God has in our, for us in our lives because we stop listening and following the one that created us. We get into trouble. We get into problems. Peter did not get this at first. I love this verse. I love how the Bible connects ever, all these pieces together. Romans 8, 28, we quote this all the time. But let me combine this with what, what we're studying right now. And we know that all things work together for good, Okay. So imagine this in Peter's life. Everything, Peter followed me. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. Okay, I don't get me. I don't understand. You're a rock. I'm no rock. Okay, whatever. Keep following me. So here Peter is going through all these things. Everything that he did to mess up with, where was Jesus? Right there. You might mess up in life, but everything's going to be different. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to what? His purpose. You're called according to something. You're not just called, you're called to a purpose. You have purpose on your life. God was leading him along, and I'll tell you, everything that God was doing is constantly forming Peter into his purpose. Let me illustrate it like this, verse 29 in that next verse. And it says, for whom he did foreknow, before you were formed in the belly of your mom, God said he knew you. Before I formed you, before he foreknew he also did predestine to be conformed to the image of his son. You know, it's been God's plan all along to take that rough you, to take the rough Peter that he found on the shoreline that day, and Peter's sitting there saying, I'm no rock, I'm nothing. God says, just follow me. I will make you fishers of men. You know why a lot of people stay rough and they never experience fulfillment in their life and they never experience purpose in their life because they stop following the one that created them. Because he'll make all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. He had planned for all this. Sit there and say, what does it mean to be a Christian? It means to be Christ-like. He's forming you into the image of his son to be more Christ-like every single day. Say, man, Pastor Tony, I'm such a mess though. Man, you're going to sit there. If Jesus came up and called me the rock, I don't know if I'd fully understand that because, man, I've been, I've been saved for a year. I've been saved for five years or whatever. Man, I'm, I'm not any of that. The, the Bible says Philippians 1, 6, being confident. Listen to this. Being confident of this very thing that he 
which begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of uh, Jesus Christ. Let me put it like this. You might be a rock in progress. You are a leader in progress. God knows your potential because he made your potential. He created you with potential. He created you with purpose. He's just not done with you yet. So when you look in the mirror, don't sit there and say, I'm such a mess. Just look in the mirror and say, God's still working on me. I'm, I'm a work in progress. But I'll tell you, you'll, still be, you'll, you'll just be a mess in progress if you stop listening to God. If you stop following the one that knows what he's doing with your life, you'll just be a mess. You just can't see it yet. God says to every dad, I'm going to make you a rock, but you got to follow me. God says to every mom, I'm going to make you a leader, but you got to follow me. God says to every teenager, I'll make you a generation changer, but you got to follow me. God, you've got to follow God. Stop listening to the opinions of other people and start listening to the author and the inventor and the creator of your life. Because he knows what he's doing with you. You are more than what you know, but you were created for more than what you know. Well, l- listen to this. That there's a question that lingers in every person's mind of why am I here? Why am I here? What is my purpose? And I'll tell you, the suicide mind, and I, and I know I've said this a lot, but I'm telling you that the, the enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy you understand? He wants to pull you out of that family. He wants to pull you out of church. He wants to pull you out of that potential. He loves to destroy your mind, destroy your life, destroy your future. That's what he does. And like I said, we're addressing these issues because suicide rate is up 33% over the last 20 years. That ought to bother us. Ought to bother us. Because God looks at Peter and says, Peter, I'm going to call you a stone, but the reason why God was doing that, because he knew the potential that he had. Without purpose, we feel unvaluable. Without purpose, we we feel expendable. Because in my mind, if I was to leave, who would care? I don't do anything. If I was to leave, who would care? I, I, I don't matter to anybody. You know what those are? Lies, lies, lies. If Satan could come up to you and say, your life doesn't matter, then all of a sudden, in your mind, if I was to disappear, it wouldn't matter to nobody anyways. Last part of verse 42 again. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. Peter's sitting there scratching his head, probably thinking, a stone? What does a stone do? I mean, you think about it. God's, God's going to reveal something later to him that is a huge, amazing thing of what a stone does. But at this part, he doesn't get it. You might not fully understand at this part what you were called to do. I like it, like went back to my testimony when I was 16 years old. I had no idea that God was going to call me to preach. I, I, I had no idea that God was going to put me on a platform and allow me to lead and teach and, and love. And I had no idea that God would bless me with three amazing kids and a beautiful wife. I had no idea. But I'm so glad at the beginning that God knew from the very beginning that he had purpose for my life. And as long as I was following him, I would accomplish that purpose in my life. Jeremiah 29, 11, when we looked at this last week, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil. He goes, I know what I'm doing for it with your life. I already know. So Jesus calls Peter to go with him. And he teaches him every aspect of the way. He's teaching him to to be able to accomplish the things that he's leading him to do, the things that he's leading him to accomplish in his life. God was doing all these amazing things. It's so funny how when you feel so insecure in your life and you don't totally get it, that God keeps confirming to your life that affirmation, that confirmation of what you are. So one day Jesus gets to this spot and he's talking about the gates of hell. Now if you fully understand Matthew 16, 18, Peter didn't fully understand Matthew 16, 18. Peter did not fully understand what was going on in Matthew 16, 18. Because he said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now think about what he was doing. He was establishing two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of Satan. And they understood this because they lived in the day and age of kingdoms. He said, there's a kingdom and it's got great gates and it's got a war, warriors, an army, and it has all this and it's out to destroy this. But Jesus said, I've come into this world and I'm going to build my own kingdom. It's going to start with a rock. 
Now, the rock in that passage that we were understanding, that people sit there and say, upon this rock, I'll build my church, because he called him Peter. He didn't call him Simon, he called him Peter. You know what he was doing in that passage? He was referencing Peter as the rock. He was referencing Simon as the rock. But there's a difference in that passage. The one word that he was talking about when he was talking about Peter, he was talking about a piece of a rock or the little rock. It wasn't the same definition of the rock in that passage. He was saying you're going to be part of something. But the word rock that he used for the word upon this rock, when he said this rock, that Greek word means a massive rock or a strong rock of what he was talking about in that passage. So what Jesus was explaining to him, and he said, I'm going to build something great and powerful. I'm going to do it on the strength of Jesus Christ as being the solid rock. But then he was talking about Peter. You're going to be part of something. Later in the passage, Peter was testifying of this. And Peter says uh, he's, that, that God's going to build a kingdom or build the church out of living stones. Living stones. Every single one of us. You say, I don't matter. I have no significance. And God says, literally, I'm going to take every one of my people and make them part of something big. Something so big that you're going to be on the rock of Jesus Christ on a foundation. And the gates of hell will never, ever, ever be able to prevail against what God is doing. Never. You were created with purpose. You were created by God that gives us our identity. It's our identity in our life that gives us our purpose. But it is our purpose that gives us fulfillment. Looking back is the only way to know this, okay? So I have to jump forward a little bit. It's the only way to know this. See, in my life, I didn't understand. And I know I'm using my own testimony of this, and I'll use Peter here in a second. But in my life, I fully didn't understand what fulfillment was. To, to, to live in that spot, to know that I'm where God wants me to be and doing what God wants me to be, it, it gives you a satisfaction. It gives us this, this peace in your heart that goes beyond description. When I was 16 years old, if you would have said, Tony, you're a rock, and I'm just using that as a parallel to them. If, Tony, you're a leader. Let's just use that. You're a leader. I'll be like, I'm no leader. I just began to follow God all the way along. Yesterday I had a weird day. I watched my middle child, Logan, walk across the stage, receive a diploma, walk off that stage getting ready two months to go off to college. You know, so many emotions, so many feelings going through my mind. But I begin to, you know, the reality, if anybody's been where you have these life-changing moments of that, you begin to step back. And I begin to look at my life and I thought, how in the world did I get here? How did I get here? How did I, that I was so insecure and so non-confident in myself, and I couldn't even speak in front of people, and I'm, I'm not saying that I've arrived, but let me tell you, I'm a work in progress by any means. But can I tell you what God has done in my life? Can I tell you that God has blessed me with three amazing kids that I didn't deserve, and God, God has blessed me with a beautiful wife that I look back and I had no idea at the time that what God was going to do. And along the way that God was leading me to, to go to Trinity Baptist College and to answer the phone call to come to Fellowship Baptist Church and all the things that God, all along the way, I look back and I'm sitting there and I'm just, I'm not, don't take this the wrong way, but I'm just, I can only testify with what God's done in my life. I can honestly say that I don't have regret in my life. I'm not saying that I've not done things that I regret. But I can say that I know where I'm at and I know what I'm doing is what God wants me to do. And so many people don't have that in their life. I, I can look at it and say, I know I'm married to the woman that God wanted me to marry and I know I have the kids that God wanted me to have and I know I get to do something that I don't deserve every single week and I get to do it and God does something in my mind. I'm not trying to figure out who I am. I'm not trying to figure out what I do. I'm just trying to continue to listen to the one that did all this in my life. Peter, all the way 30 years later, he, he's, he's, in, in 1 Peter chapter 5, at the end of that chapter, he, he begins to testify. Peter wrote two, two epistles. He wrote two, uh, two books at the end of the Bible. And, and at the end of that, he begins to say this verse, and he's, and he's, he's testifying of this. And if Richard, if you guys can bring that up on the screen for me, 
Um, but the God of all grace, now listen to this, this is Peter, 30 years later, 30 years later, Okay, and says, but the God of all grace who hath called us to his eternal glory by Jesus Christ, after I suffered a while, make perfect, established, strengthened, and settled you. Can I break that down for just a minute? This is, this is what that verse is saying. He said perfected, or the word perfect literally means to accomplish, or he did something in my life. He said, man, I had no idea. I was nothing more than a mess up. But when I was identified by God, when he said, you are a rock, he called me Peter. He called me to follow him. He said, I can look back, and I'm, I know that God accomplished things in my life. He that began a good work is going to complete it. He said he is established. We, we would use the word to establish or to confirm or place someone somewhere to establish something, to placement, belonging. God has placed me somewhere, strengthened me to be strong. Somebody could come up to Peter and say, you're a loser. Whatever. Okay, dude, I'm following my Savior. It doesn't matter. Remember when he was shaken because he was denying Jesus three times and he had a a maiden, it was a young lady that came up to him and was pushing him around. Are you a disciple? No, I'm not a disciple. He was shaken in his identity. In Acts chapter 2, he stands firm and preaches who, who Jesus Christ is and settle you. Emotional, mental settlement. I know who I am. I know what I do. I know where I belong. I know the calling on my life. Do you know what God wants to do in every single one of our lives? Is to bring us to this place in our life that you are settled with the peace of God, the instructions of God, the love of God. God brings us to a place in our life. A few weeks ago, I was telling you guys a story about my sister. I was telling you a story about how she came to a life that, a point in her life that she allowed Satan to seek, to kill, and destroy. How she attempted to take her life and how God had a bigger plan. I was getting ready to wrap up and say, let me tell you the rest of the story of everything that God did in my sister's life to bring her out of that. I didn't realize at that time that I was writing this out that my sister would be here this morning. So I'd like you guys to hear it for yourself. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to come and just share my heart with you. Like Tony said, I'm his sister. Um, my name is Christine Atwood. I have been raised in church my whole life. I have loved being in any kind of ministry I can throughout the church. Uh, Awanas, singing in the choir. Um, I was our puppet leader at our church. I love being at church. I love being around the people of God. But there become a point in my Christian walk where anytime I was struggling or having a hard time with anything and I wanted to go to somebody and, and talk to them about it, it, Satan just put in my head, you can't do that. They'll think you're a bad Christian. And so I would keep it to myself. And, and I'm not really sure why I ever felt that way because Nowhere in the Bible does God ever tell us that he expects us to be perfect or anything that we're going through just to keep it to ourselves. If anything, God tells us the complete opposite. But that's exactly what Satan wanted me to believe. And after so long, it, I just started getting so worn down. And I never realized how worn down I was and how broken I was until the day I went home I remember taking a shower, sitting on the edge of my bed, and then I just reached for a bottle of pills. And I remember pouring them in my hand. It just started swallowing them, a handful after a handful. And I just thought to myself, what is the point? I am failing at everything. I remember waking up in the hospital with a tube down my throat and IVs coming out of every part of my body. And I just remember I was so heartbroken. Why? Why did God not take me home? Why? 
I remember within the length of time I was in the hospital, I flatlined twice, my lungs collapsed 50%. My vocal cords were damaged from having so many tubes bit down my throat, but I was okay with not talking. I had nothing to say. I remember having so many visitors and cards that were sent to me and gifts that I received, but I would just sit there and think, they just don't know. The, the second time I flatlined, they had to cut me open from my chest past my belly button, and they had to leave me open for three days because my body just becomes so toxic. And after just so much time going by and being in the hospital and going through so many tests and just everything that I had to go through within that length of time, I've, they finally allowed me to go home. And I remember going home with a feeding tube. I was still recovering from being cut open. Um, I was so weak, I had a hard time walking. But slowly, I, I started to build my strength back. I started being able to talk little by little. And I remember Tony calling me, and I remember him saying that he had a youth rally coming up, and he would love for me to come and give my testimony. Well, I thought he was crazy. So I told him, well, I'll pray about it because that's a nice Christian way of saying no. And then I remember calling my pastor just to vent to him about how crazy Tony was, that he would want me to come and give my testimony at church. And then he continued to talk and ask me if I would do the same thing at our church. And I just remember thinking, all of these people that gave up their time and traveled to the hospital to see me, all of these cards and gifts, how do you want me to get in front of them and tell them that all of it was my fault? So I remember going to church and I remember giving my testimony. And as soon as I was done, I went to the first seat I could get to and I sat down. I just put my head down. And I remember feeling a tap on my shoulder. And when I looked up, there was a line of people, not to shame me, but to love me. They hugged me and told me that they love me. And they told me that they are here for me and they are gonna help me to get through this. I remember it was like God himself come down and hugged me. There was a time after that, a little time went by and I ended up coming and staying with Tony and Jen for a little while and I met my husband, Danny, and it's the best thing I've ever done. This God blessed me. And I remember within our first year of marriage, we were so excited because we were gonna have a baby. And I remember we had a miscarriage. But this time with this struggle, I gave it to God. And with my church family, God's people, we got through that. And I'm telling you, the power of God's people is strong. And when Satan would tear me down and tell me my life was nothing, God blessed us with three beautiful little girls. It's, they're eight, nine, and 10. And just to be their mom and to pour God into them is the most humbling thing God could ever allow me to do. And then God also has allowed me and my husband to work in the college and career ministry at our church. And just to be able to tell them, God doesn't expect us to be perfect. God gave us a family for a reason, for us to get through this life together. And Satan had me so fooled in thinking that my life would not impact anybody, whether I was here 
or not. And when Satan was trying to tear me down and tell me that I was worthless and broken, God picked me up and brushed me off and reminded me that I am his child and he will never leave me nor forsake me. And he is not done with me yet. Satan is a liar. God, at the beginning of your life, created you with purpose and a plan. It's just we can't see it. There's so much more to all of us. And when we stop listening to our creator, we stop listening to what he's doing, we get lost and confused and we, we just, Satan begins to tell us that we don't matter and our, we're unvaluable and nobody cares and you're not gonna good at anything. We just go back to the master. He said, you're loved, you're created with purpose. I have a plan for you, a great plan for you. I don't just have life for you. I, I have come that you have life and that you might have it more abundantly. That's the truth. But you only find that truth in a relationship with Jesus Christ. <laughs>